Hello, hello. Welcome to Coffee with Tina. I am Tina Swibbin, and today we're going to talk about a really important topic. Um, actually, a multi part question that came through. So, the question we're talking about today how to handle a narcissistic ex who doesn't follow the court order or the schedule, puts the child in the middle, pays child support late, and sends belittling accusatory emails on the regular. So we are going to talk about all of that. But first, I am the author of Divorcing a Narcissist. I am founder of One Mom's Battle, CEO of the High Conflict Divorce Coach Certification Program, where I train people over an eight-week course to do what I do, to serve as a divorce coach, a divorce consultant, for those going up against narcissists in family court. The fine print is I am not an attorney. I'm not qualified to give you legal advice. We are a community of survivors who come together and talk about divorcing a narcissist or a high conflict toxic person or child custody issues when a narcissist is involved. Maybe you weren't even married to this horrible human. Always consult with your attorney. They are your voice and your advocate inside and outside of the courtroom. Um, I want to give a shout out to Alienation Industry. You can go to alienationindustry.com. This is our latest partnership with Breaking Code Silence. We are going to really be hitting the alienation industry head on, working to expose it for what it is and asking for a ban on reunification camps, um, which is another part of our 50 protests, 50 states. We will be in Utah on February 17th at the state capitol demanding justice for Ty and Brinley. This case is truly unbelievable. It's difficult to grasp. If you are interested in getting your state on our calendar, you can send an email to 50 protests, 50 states, plural, plural, <laughs> 50 protests, 50 states at gmail.com. Um, go to our website, 50 protests, 50 states.com to see which states are already scheduled. If you don't see your state scheduled, but you think it should be, uh, make sure you reach out to us by email. So today's question, again, how to handle a narcissistic ex who doesn't follow the court order or the schedule, puts your child in the middle, pays support late, sends belittling horrible emails regularly. Um, you know, how do you navigate that? There is no rule book. Um, I think, you know, there are five different categories wrapped into one question. So I think it's something that the majority of us can relate to, and it describes the most common type of narcissist that we are all up against. So I want to break it down piece by piece. Number one, he doesn't follow the court order or the schedule. So for me, there are a few things that immediately come to mind. First and foremost is the reality of the court system. We have all struggled to have boundaries with the narcissist, you know, for years probably during the relationship. And when we are physically holding this court order in hand, it feels like the biggest boundary of all. And then add in the fact that the majority of us are rule followers. So when we get a court order, we give it a tremendous amount of weight, and we would never even think about defying a court order. That is a legal document. We take that very seriously. Here's the problem that comes in. Um, speaking in very general terms, a court order in family court is not the same as a court order in any other branch of our judicial system. In my humble opinion, and from what I have seen over the past 13 years, a court order is considered to be the default position for both parties to fall back on if they cannot reach an agreement. But the courts really want to see people figuring it out themselves and just using that as a fallback. 
So there is rarely any backlash or punishment or accountability for someone who is not following a family court order or completely violating it. I will share, I'm going to give you two different examples from my own case. So it was about a year, a little little more than a year into my case, I filed a motion to revise our court order. And it was my goal to show, you know, to notify the court of the constant violations. So just about six months prior to that, our custody evaluator had created a parenting plan I was forced into signing it, um, backed into a corner, literally crying. It was horrible. But she really intimidated me that if I didn't sign it, I would be charged thousands of dollars. It was just, uh, she was a horrible human. But that aside, you know, this parenting plan that had been created and that we signed off on out of the 16 requirements that he was supposed to comply with, he was in violation of 11 of those. That's a lot. Common sense would tell us that that many violations related to a court order would be a big deal. However, not only did the judge not care, he removed the requirements, all of the things that my ex was in violation for. So it was almost as if he had been rewarded for defying the court orders, and we each walked away with a different message that day. The message I received was, you know, the court orders were not a boundary that I could trust or count on, and this court system did not care about my children's best interest or safety. You know, that was what I walked away with. The message he received was confirmation that he was truly above the law, and accountability. And it was also an invitation for him to continue to defy the court orders. The feed supply he received was the look of shock and defeat on my face because I left that day completely devastated. And that's when the reality of the system really started sinking in for me. Um, So back to, you know, I would also really want to ensure that the foundation that we are standing on in a situation like this is one of radical acceptance with equal parts of expectation management. And it took me a while to get there. I wish somebody would have explained all of these things to me and what the court system is truly about, which is parental rights, rewarding bad behavior, And um, it's really, it's a doozy, especially when you're just starting out. Um, So radical acceptance, managing our expectations. If we are expecting a narcissist um, to do the right thing or to do things the way that we would do them, we have not fully and radically accepted the situation for what it is. And we are likely projecting our own positive qualities and traits onto someone who is not deserving. So if we're expecting this person to follow the court order, follow the schedule, we are going to set ourselves up for disappointment time and time again. I always like to put the icing on that. It's not fair. It's incredibly wrong. And it puts so much extra responsibility and wait on us to do damage control, to show up, to, you know, overcompensate, to make up for their failures and shortcomings, and to be the strong role model that our children are dependent on us to be. And that's in addition to all of the other things that we have on our plate as single parents, as primary parents, those of us who are working, those of us like me who is forced to act as my own attorney, You know, it's a lot. And with all of this said, you know, I don't think we accept this as our fate or as our forever reality. I think we keep documenting, we continue being strategic in our communication. And I do want to make sure the word strategic is not taken to mean manipulative because I, people question that a lot when I say I teach people strategy. 
When I think of strategic communication, it is a combination of me being who I authentically am outside of the narcissist. Because when I'm giving him my energy or her in some cases, I am not able to show up and be who I authentically am. If I'm angry with that person, which is justified and, you know, we have a right to be. But when I'm giving him that power over me, it affects how I show up. So, you know, that combined with my knowledge of our court system and that's more radical acceptance on top of radical acceptance. So we've got layers of it going on. Um, When I am communicating, I am communicating to the judge. Yes, it is technically written to my ex-husband, his name, his email address, you know, that's who I'm sending it to. But I used to keep a little post-it on my desk and on my computer, and it said, to judge C.C. Seth, the name I used for him. And that was my reminder that everything I put in writing was for the court, not for not for him. Um, you know, there you never know what's going to be read by the judge someday, and it's always my goal to show who I am. Um, you know, my communication is if it's ever put on display in the courtroom. You know, because here's the thing: we all know that if I were to send ninety nine emails that are glowing and positive and authentically me. But then I send one out of a moment of frustration where I just snap and I get to the point where I'm just, I can't take it anymore. You've hurt my kids. You've done something. That one email out of 100 is will be the one placed in the courtroom projector and blown up on the wall for everyone to see. And now they're painting a picture of me using that one email when the other 99 represented who I am as a person and a co-parent. The problem when something like that happens is, you know, now they put us both under the same high conflict category and the water becomes muddy. And it really feels like we're under scrutiny and they get away with everything. And there is a gender bias in the courtroom. And I do believe that is something very real. Um, you know, and, and I started out in this battle being very gender neutral and, and that, you know, dads get a bad rap too. And they do, you know, there are some really great dads. I was raised by my dad. When I first went into advocacy work, I was really quick to correct, you know, moms and dads and you know, all of that. I will say our, our court system, the way I see it through my lens of 13 years of advocacy and, and watching court cases all across the country, if an unhealthy parent um, shows up with a pulse, they're given five gold stars. Yet the healthy parent is under an enormous amount of scrutiny. And it's, it's really unfair, you know, radical acceptance. There's another layer of that. Um, so then the next part of this question, he puts our child in the middle. So outside of documenting these things and giving our kids all of the support and resources that are available, what is happening on the other side is really not in our control. You know, Sam's abuse that, you know, can be proven and all of those things, um, you know, there are different situations. But in general, these little, these things, and little is not the right word to use because all of these things that are affecting our kids build and build and build. And our kids are having to deal with topics that are beyond them. And you know, we see the consequences of that all the time. But, you know, generally speaking, the things happening on the other side, really, we don't have control over that. I had to make a decision very early on that my energy, what little I had left, would be channeled into being the best, most centered, regulated parent this side of the Mississippi. And I had to keep my own oxygen mask on, I worked very hard to shelter my kids from the reality of what was happening. And some days that was easier said than done. And I gave myself a lot of grace. 
uh, during the really bumpy sections of the road. Um, you know, we all, we all experience these things. They would come home, they would share things with me, and I would always meet them right where they were, validate their feelings, the good, the bad, the ugly. I worked hard to keep my tank filled, that oxygen mask, you know, at, at a minimum, I knew where it was and how to find it if needed. And I always provided them with a safe place to land and reprieve from the chaos. Um, we know our kids come home from the other parents' parenting time, and they can be like pressure cookers. It's not safe for them to emote over there. And so they hold it all in. And then, you know, it's a, a really sad, heartbreaking situation. Um, and it can take them a couple of days to bounce back. And for many of us, it's they finally start bouncing back. And then it's time to start this whole cycle over again. Um, you know, even when our kids can't articulate what is happening, they know. It is our job to show them what healthy looks like, to show them what unconditional love looks like, but also to show them what boundaries are and practicing all of these things that we preach. The older they get, the more aware they become. And, um, you know, each chapter is requires different tools and support to navigate. I am a firm believer in having a trauma-informed therapist. Most people naively believe that all therapists are trauma-informed, and that's not the case. Um, we need someone like that in our corner to help our kids navigate these things. And so many are unable to put the, to get someone on the team. X may deny it. The court may deny it. Um, at a minimum, having someone who you can talk to, a child psychologist, a child therapist who's trauma-informed that can help you to navigate these difficult topics as they come up. And a big one for so many of us, he pays support late. This is another topic that dovetails right into the brokenness of this entire system. In this court system, you know, support and parental rights are kept completely separate. It is very rare that you will find a judge who holds a narcissist accountable uh, financially. The financial button is their biggest button, and many people do not like my position on this topic. And over the years, I have received some pretty heated messages, and um, I would go so far as to say hate mail on this topic. Um, and I get it. You know, everybody is entitled to their own approach, um, their own way of thinking, and my goal from day one was to become financially self-sufficient, and it took years for me to get to that place. Um, it was a gradual shift, and finally I got to the point that if he paid support, I saw it as a bonus, and it allowed me to provide my daughters with extra activities, shopping for clothes, necessary items that were not in the budget, but you know they were in that extra category. I refused to stay under his thumb financially. He liked having me on a puppet string, and he liked the control, even though in reality he despised paying support. He would have rather paid a nanny uh, to raise the kids because he would know that's how to hurt me. Um, and if he knew I was dependent on his support payments, it gave him a sick feed to withhold or to pay late. And, you know, I could write an entire book just on the financial games and shenanigans that he pulled. Um, you know, there was a point in time where he was living in a $7 million mansion and I was going to a local food pantry at a church to feed my kids. And um, we also found out around that time he was working three different jobs in sales probably making anywhere between twenty and forty thousand dollars a month and I couldn't afford groceries. So that stung. Um, and in the end, my strategy on this, which was never intended to be a strategy, 
was what truly allowed me to terminate parental rights. So his arrears balance grew and grew, and it was a game to him. And it was rare that I ever held him accountable, even when I needed the money. Um, after the first few years, the first few years, I absolutely held him accountable because I could not survive without that, that support payment. But I knew if I pushed the financial button, he would push my button, which involved the kids. So I learned to avoid that button at all costs. And for those of you who are not familiar with my story, um, the arrears balance did grow over $100,000. And when his passport was stolen out of his car and he needed to get it renewed for a work trip, the state of California would not renew his passport um, because of this outstanding debt. And there were other things going on, you know, at the time, but to make a really long story shorter, um, if you have not read my book, I forgave the entire balance, over $100,000, and we were able to go forward with termination of parental rights, and eventually my husband, Glenn, was able to adopt the girls. Um, I could have never predicted how that played out, but looking back, I can see the decisions I made to, you know, walk away from it is a lot of that is why we are safe today and have this new chapter. Um, so in reference to the question that was asked, it's probably the number one complaint that so many share, and that is the frustration over child support or spousal support. These individuals get five gold stars for the court for paying at all. So someone paying late it doesn't even register on the scale of importance for the court and actually, you know, trying to hold them accountable if we're talking late payments um, is going to backfire. And then it seems like the courts handed out a whole bunch of victim cards for COVID and free passes to not pay support. And we're still seeing the repercussions from all of that. So um, my heart is with you and I, I absolutely understand the frustration that comes with this. Um, and then he sends the next part of the question. He sends belittling accusatory emails on a regular basis. This is where we implement yellow rock communication. If you are not familiar with yellow rock communication, go to the one mom's battle, um, website, one mom's battle.com scroll to the very bottom of the page, put your name and information in for, our newsletter, and it will automatically generate a free PDF, um, all of the important things you know, need to know on how to communicate with this type of person. So a couple of examples, if someone were sending me, you know, horrible emails accusing me of different things that were not true, one would be your attempt to portray me in a negative light is noted. Number two, your attempt to create a false narrative is noted, or this appears to be an attempt to create a false narrative for litigation purposes. So things like that, you want to take what we've created in the Yellow Rock Guide and make it your own. Um, you don't want them to Google it and find it online and go, oh, this is the guide you've been using. You know, you don't want it to sound like someone else is writing your emails. And I have to say, check with your attorney before you implement the, this or any other style of communication. Um, and I will say also, you know, if you're struggling in any of these categories, documentation, strategic communication, um, lots of these things, I have online courses available at One Mom's Battle. You can download them and watch them instantly, and you'll get the PDF, all the slides that come with it. Um, just go to onemomsbattle.com, click online courses. And because this quote sums everything up so personally, so perfectly, I have not had enough coffee yet. Um, there's a meme that's been floating around on the internet for years, and it says, trying to understand the behavior of the narcissist is like trying to smell the number nine. So all of that that I just went through, breaking that question down um, piece by piece, 
a lot of it, you know, I would reference that meme. We have to find humor wherever we can in this journey. And my heart is with you. Make sure you're joining us for the 50 protests across 50 states. Utah is next, February 17th, 10 a.m. at the state capitol in Salt Lake City. Let's come together and demand justice for Ty and Brinley. Take care, everyone.